if you're trying to do something of significance, you need to have a point of view. You can't change every time someone doesn't like something about who you are, because then you don't have a point of view. I think that if something is important enough to you, mm -hmm. it bears repeating over and over and over again. It's quiet quitting. Yeah. Which is, which is essentially saying, I'm only gonna do the bare minimum. That is an overreaction to being treated poorly, and that's a leadership problem. Yes. If you work for a bad leader and you're the person that's quiet quitting, you're just allowing yourself to be the victim. You can't just say, well, that person's not great, and so I'm gonna let my career or my progress be stunted because of it. I'm very excited for some of you to meet a guy by the name of Will Gadara. Now, Will is a restaurateur. I like saying it that way because it feels like that's how it needs to be said. And Will is a two-time, he and his restaurant partner, they won twice, the number one restaurant in the world. Do you understand how difficult that is to do? Here is Will Gadara in studio with me talking about leadership, hospitality, and more. Here we go. So one of the things I love about you, Will, and I had the privilege to see you in the wild, in action, in a fabulous <laughs> documentary on Netflix called Seven Days Out. Yeah. And um, and so I feel like I got a little bit of a cheat code also seeing you speak yeah. uh, at our Entree Leadership Summit. And so I want to ask you about culture building. And you posit in this book that 30 minutes can transform a culture. And I, I got sucked into that because I was like, I see what you're doing there. And I like that. I think it's provocative. Yeah. But I actually believe you. Why are you so confident in that? And then how do you do it? Well, so, okay, 30 minutes a day. That's correct. 30 minutes a day. That's right. And it, listen, okay, I believe that what gets talked about consistently defines what a culture ends up becoming. Mm -hmm. What gets talked about is what the team thinks about. Yeah. So in restaurants, we have this thing. It's called pre-meal. And for the 30 minutes right before we open our doors to the public, we get our team. It's not when people are eating dinner. They stand in a circle with complete focus and... We, we connect on a daily basis. I believe it's the most important 30 minutes of the day because it's when we cease being a collection of individuals and we come together as a trusting team. Mm. It's not super novel, right? Plenty of restaurants sure. do. You've probably seen movies where like oh, yeah. the guy and like the old hotel is like criticizing whether people's shoes are polished. Right, and right. in most restaurants, it's when they talk about what's new in the menu, what wine are they pouring by the glass, when is health enrollment or, or whatever. I believe it needs to be so much more than that. Because it's not where you should be talking about what you're doing. It's where you should be talking about the why behind it. Yes. Right? Like, I believe that there is such nobility in serving other people. Mm -hmm. In restaurants, I believe we can help people celebrate some of the most important moments of their lives or give them the grace, if only for a few hours, to forget about their most difficult ones. I think unless you name why the work matters, you're never going to be really good at it. Mm -hmm. And so in 30 minutes a day, that's when you talk about why does the work matter? It's when you run through your cultural isms, the yep. things that you've articulated that makes what you want to be distinct from what everyone else wants to be. It's when I, as a leader, speak to my team about what's important to me. It's when I invite them to join the conversation. And if you do that every single day, it can transform your business. I believe that if every customer service business, every bank branch, every insurance office, if everyone took 30 minutes before they opened the doors, man, I think it would just transform customer service as we know it in America. I know it would. And I want to stay here for a second. And I'm curious if when you did that, were you trying to say the same thing in different ways? In other words, keep it fresh? Or were you saying, forget that. We're going to hit the same things over and <laughs> over to keep us really clear. I'm curious how you did it. Well, I think it's I think it's a little bit of both, okay. honestly. Like I would decide what I was going to talk about on a weekly basis. And by the way, that 30 minutes, if anyone chooses to do that, mm -hmm. you can't waste it. You don't walk into the meeting and then decide once you get there what you're going to talk about. Very key point. Right? Like this you need to be just, very hey, yeah. Wee. No, like what do we need to talk yeah. about as an organization to move the ball forward? Yeah. And then I would talk about the same thing for a week. Because A, sometimes people on your team, no matter how good they are, they're yep. just not paying attention one day or another. And Correct. like like repetition is important. Yeah. And then let's say after three months of every week talking about a different thing, then you take it from the top. 
I, I think that if something is important enough to you, mm-hmm. it bears repeating over and over and over again. It's not dissimilar to how you raise a child. It's not like yes. there's something that you want to be a non-negotiable for your child and you tell them for a week and then you just no. expect them to hold on to it forever. No, I'm still telling my 13, 14 <laughs> and 16 year old, put your dishes yeah. in the dishwasher yeah. for the love of God. Yeah. Do and, it. And, and by the way, pre-meal, that 30 minutes a day for whatever business chooses to employ it, it's when you talk about the aspiration. Yep. And then it's when you affirm the people Mm -hmm. that are rising to the standard. Um, Because when you affirm one person for actually like, you know, doing the thing that you're trying to get everyone to collectively do, two things happen. One, I believe affirmation is addictive. Yep. No matter how cool someone in your team pretends to be, no one is not energized from having been affirmed and they want it again. And by the way, everyone else in the team, when they see someone being praised, they want that too. Yes. Well, the data bears this out. Yeah. Uh, we were on the same stage at our Entree Leadership Summit in May, and my talk the day before yours, I talked about the rules of engagement. Hmm. And I poured into the largest study that Gallup has ever done on employee engagement. Okay. And they boil the whole study down. This is to validate what you're saying. They boil the whole study down to what drives employee engagement to three human needs that must be met by the leader. Okay. One, purpose and meaning in the work. Yeah. Two, recognition of their unique contribution Hmm. three a relationship with their leader but number two is what you just said yeah people are still little boys and little girls for sure who want to be called out hey i saw you did last night in this situation it is exactly what we want to do at this restaurant by the way i'm still like you still want that like yes when whenever if i'm with anyone and i ask a question and they say good question yeah. Even that small amount Feels of affirmation. Great. I'm like, well, yeah, thanks. Well, <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it was a pretty good it's question. It's so true. We all want to be recognized for our uniqueness, and yes. that's what you're talking about. And that's what's brilliant. And you can do that in that intimacy of before we go to battle. Yeah. Because that's what it is. It's not dissimilar to a locker room speech. Uh, just exactly every single right. day. And there's a reason why, like, the greatest teams, their coaches are the ones that can inspire with words. And yeah. I just think it's so important. The, the, and the, the reason why... I liken what other people should do to a restaurant is because it's very structured. It's the 30 minutes before we open the door. Yeah. You need to create systems in order for these things to take root. You need to create practices around them. That's right. If anyone who's listening to this is like, all right, yeah, I'm going to start doing a 30 minute a day thing. And they try to do it at one o'clock one day, two 30 the next day, the third day, yeah. they're just not going to find time to do it. You need to be intentional enough and, And just make a decision and hold the time and stick with it. I want you to comment. We're staying in this lane, but legendary management guru, Peter Drucker, famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah, I agree with that. That's what you're talking about. Although, yes. Because I say the systems, the reason I thought of that is this. I think your systems help develop the culture. I was about to say, I think you can be strategic in your pursuit of culture. Yes. And so like, yeah, culture... If you have to choose one, choose culture every single yeah. day of the week. But I don't think you, you, you don't stumble into culture. No. Culture is a living, breathing thing right. and it needs to be nourished. And like, but I think that's what he was saying. I think he was saying to your point, you're going, if we are intentional with systems, yes, I mean 30 minutes yes. before every opening, we are doing this. That is a system, but that system allows for I understand the yes. right culture. No, I mean, you're saying it. I'm just validating what you're yes. saying. And Drucker was saying this, you know, decades ago. For sure. And I think that's what you've developed. And I think that's what this book really outlines. This book is just my way, uh, the title, Unreasonable Hospitality. It's, listen, anyone that I've ever met that's been very, very successful at creating something, whether it's a designer, an entrepreneur, someone in tech, someone yeah. in real estate, retail, whatever, is pretty unreasonable in pursuit of the thing that they're making. Yeah. Right? They're they're relentless. They're relentlessly intentional in pursuit of every single detail. I'm saying it's time for people to be just as unreasonable in pursuit of people as all those others are in pursuit of products. I, I, I think you're right. I think hospitality is always the secret sauce, no matter what the industry is, the way you treat people. For sure. However, 
I'm curious to know if you feel like it's now more important than ever because of the world in which we live and how oh our world's gosh. been turned upside down. So the competition is different. You're seeing restaurant chains, restaurants, fast food is being revolutionized mm -hmm. because of the way we are now purchasing. For sure. Delivery. Yeah. You're competing now against delivery. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I mean, I think it's more important across industries, right? Like, yes. And I'll say two things. One, following COVID, People weren't like struggling to buy stuff no. throughout the pandemic. If people missed anything, it was connection, right? With, without a doubt. And experience. Yeah. Like but, I want to go to a nice restaurant sometime just for the ambiance. But because that experience, going to a restaurant, especially a good restaurant, they create the conditions for connection. Absolutely right. right. And so people missed connection. And I don't think that's gone away. I think people were no. deprived of it so long. It kind of renewed our perspective in realizing how important that is. I, I want to validate that right here in Williamson County. Yeah. So some of the restaurant chains, which I won't mention that yeah. teenagers like to go to, yes. that we would go to as a family, <laughs> yes. right? Uh, they can't even fill up a dining room. They won't open up a dining room because they don't have the servers. And yet the really nice restaurants that Stacy and I like to go to yeah. are booming. Yes. And I think it validates your point. For sure. Be because because they're the ones that are losing. Well, yeah, if you can order business. delivery, you're going to get the same food. And why would you go there if you're not going to even feel any sort of genuine connection to the and people that are it. serving you? You're going for the experience. Yeah. And the way you're treated is, is a big part of that. I love that. Um, okay. And I think this leads us into a, a fun part of this conversation as well, because you also uh, assert that spending 5% of your budget foolishly, yes. and I like how you choose that word. I want you to unpack that. Why is that one of the smartest things that you can do? In fact, I think you say it's the smartest thing you could do. And I want business leaders to really lean in here For sure. and understand what you're saying. Okay. So it, it's called the rule of 95.5. And it was the entire foundation to how I financially managed my businesses, which was manage my money 95% of the time like a maniac. And I mean like every single dollar, everything checked, rechecked. There's nothing that can be wasted 95% of the time such that I've earned the right to, to spend the last 5% foolishly. And I, love I put it in quotes because it's not foolish at all. It's no. actually with great intention. The reason some would call it foolish is because that 5% is a very hard 5% to measure. And this is the problem with most organizations is if they can't measure it, they don't pay attention to it. So true. If they can't like very clearly calculate the return on investment of a dollar, then they're not going to spend that dollar. And I actually believe that when you're spending money in pursuit of just doing stuff that goes above and beyond for either the people you work with or those that you serve, the return is exponential, even if impossible to measure. So true. Yeah. It's like ROB. For making sure. up a phrase, return on brand. There you go. Because your brand is going to win. And or it, ROC, return on connection. Connection. Make yeah. it whatever you want. Experience. But it is something that is intangible. But you know what? It's interesting that you said that because I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day and we were talking about brand. Um, one of the tenets in this book is take what you do seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. Yes, love that. Because um, far too often, especially in customer service organizations, we like we have these brands that we're like so carefully and meticulously building and we let by virtue of those brands, these self-imposed standards stand in the way of us doing things that will make other people happy. Yep. And my thesis is that if you are a customer service organization and you haven't made the decision that hospitality, nothing else, hospitality is your brand, then you've gotten lost yeah. somewhere along the way. That's right. If you're making a decision that is not in pursuit of hospitality because of another decision you've made, then that's a decision that that is taking you down the wrong road. It's so true. And you can't lose there. I just think of the famous Maya Angelou quote, you know? Yeah. They won't for people won't forget. I'm yeah. the back half of it. People won't forget the way you made them feel. For sure. And you've made that an anthem of your business. A hundred percent. I think it's the best quote about hospitality. The the full quote is yeah. people will forget what you say, they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. That's right. And that is everything, right? Because that's what I'm talking about with connection. People, I don't think they want anything more than to feel seen, mm. than to feel a sense of belonging. That's right. Than to feel welcome, right? And that, the way that you do that, that is with that 5%, right? That's when you just give a little grace note to the experience that, well, people will never forget. I want to go 
into the book, page 90. Okay. I circled this uh, because I, I want you to expound on it because I think this is where so many business people, and then if you're not a business owner, I don't want you to check out. This is where a lot of leaders develop massive blind spots. Hmm. It's, not a, it's not unique to you, but you make a clear statement in the book. Don't try to be all things to all people. Hmm. And and this is in a wonderful context of what you've just told us. Yeah. Please, hospitality, please the customer. Like that is the the, the maniacal drive for you. Yes. And yet, yes. <laughs> don't try to be all things to all people. I know it's not a confusing message, but unpack that for us. Well, okay. So I'm, I use that in the conversation around criticism and feedback. That's right. Um, what I'm saying is in the book, no matter how successful we got, we never stopped reading our feedback. I never stopped reading every piece of criticism, whether positive or negative that right. came out about us. Because I had this belief that the moment you, if you're in the business of serving other people and you stop reading the feedback, you're going to become irrelevant, right? You risk complacency. Yet at the same time, if you're trying to do something of significance, you need to have a point of view. And just because one person says they didn't like something that you were doing and they'd prefer you do something else, you can't change every time someone doesn't like something about who you are because then you don't have a point of view. And if you try to be all things to all people, it's just going to be a mishmash of oh, nothing. Yeah. Like you need to decide what you stand for. Yeah. And then within the context of that, be as attuned as possible to how you're making people feel such that you can course correct along the way. But yeah, I, I do believe you can't try to be everything to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And that leads me to my favorite line in the book, page 99. It really plays beautifully into the focus here on the Ken Coleman Show, which is to be who you are uniquely created to be. Yeah. In your uniqueness lies your opportunity for greatness, for not sure. the other way around. Mm -hmm. And you say this, you must be able to name for yourself why your work matters. Mm -hmm. I love the statement because you're saying you must be able to name for yourself yeah. in the quiet. Not your elevator pitch. For sure. But because the pitch will take care of itself. Yeah, yeah. Why is it so important? Well, because first of all, I believe that everyone's work matters. It does. I don't care who you are. That's correct. I don't care what you do. And some people might scoff at this. And I'm sure there's people scoffing as I'm saying it. But I guarantee if you sit down for long enough, you can figure out why you're making a positive contribution to the world. Like... You can sell insurance policies or you can sell people the comfort and security of knowing that they and their loved ones will be taken care of no matter what happens. You can sell people houses or you can sell them the homes in which they'll raise their children. You can sell people a bank account or like the ability to plan for their future, right? Like I think you need to name for yourself how you're having a positive impact on other people because here's the deal. I don't care how much you like what you do. I don't care how good you are at it. Some days are hard. And if you don't believe that there's significance to the work, it's going to be real, real hard to do a good job on those days. I think you need to have that reservoir yes. of meaning yep. to dip into when your gas tank is is near empty. And, and that's so true. And not only that, the slippery slope for people is when they begin to believe that their work doesn't matter. Yeah. And you keep allowing that narrative to skate around your brain yeah. like you're at a roller rink, you begin to believe that you don't matter. Dude, you know what? That's really true. It's, it, it's almost it's, like an individual echo chamber. It's exactly You right. start to become your own echo chamber. Yeah. I'm not valuable yeah. because my work is invaluable. Because we spend an inordinate amount of time of our lives at work. For sure. And I'm not saying that happens for everybody, but I'm saying it is a very dangerous progression well, and then by the way like even if you're a well-balanced person whose entire identity isn't defined only by what they do for a living it's enough of a meaningful part of who you are that it starts to rub off on who you are in life too without question if you don't think you're making a positive contribution to the world you're probably not going to be as good of a father or guaranteed a mother or a husband or a wife there's no question you'll drag that home with you yeah there's no but, question. But I really, I genuinely believe no matter what you do, if you decide that it matters, you can do it in a way that actually starts to matter, right? It starts to become self-perpetuating. Yeah. If you don't think your work matters, you're probably going to do it in a way that makes it 
pretty meaningless. Oh, yeah. Well, this is the phenomenon we have now. Yeah. That started on TikTok, and now it's in all the major media outlets, quiet quitting. Yeah. Which is, which is essentially saying, I'm only going to do the bare minimum, just enough to not get fired. Yeah. And that is an overreaction to being treated poorly, and that's a leadership problem. Yes. Uh, you know, I posit that people leave leaders, not companies. For sure. And, 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 and while I understand the frustration, that is settling in a way that is going to eventually affect your spirit. Yeah, it is. Because you start to go, well, I mean, just nothing matters. Well, because in that, yes, you're right. People leave leaders, not companies. And if the responsibility falls on one person and one person alone, it is the leader. Yeah. But if you work for a bad leader and you're the person that's quiet quitting, you're just allowing yourself to be the victim. Correct. You're allowing someone else's incapacity to negatively affect you. That's correct. It's a relationship, by the way, like uh, all of it is relationships. Mm -hmm. You and I are in a relationship right now. Right. Like I'm in a relationship with my boss or the people that work for me. We're, sure. And, and relationships are two way streets. If you can't just say, well, that person's not great. And so I'm going to let my career or my progress be stunted because of it. Yeah. And what, what happens long term is we settle. Yeah. And then we begin to resent. Yeah. Because we resent everybody else. We've allowed ourselves to become the victim. For sure. And then we begin to resent, and that's what begins to really cause bitterness. Um, um, I was fascinated by, and I want leaders to hear this, there's an exchange uh, between you and your business partner in the book that you unpack that yes. I find to be really refreshing. And I think there's a bunch of leadership lessons that I'm going to pull out of this for our audience as it relates to making decisions. Uh, it's in page 134, and you call it the third option. And and you remember the story, but it revolves around a disagreement about the charger. Yeah. And and if you don't know what a charger is, and, and I've been to many fine restaurants, listener and viewer, <laughs> and I didn't technically know it was called a charger. This I would have called it. This is inside baseball. The right decorative right? plate the is decorative, what I would have yeah, called it. It's the decorative plate. My wife does it at Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. And I must tell you that I was equally irritated with you in the book, because yes. I've always wondered, Stace, why do we do this? What are we doing? I end up taking it off right before everybody sits down. Yeah. And I know inherently it's because she thinks it looks pretty and thus we do it. And in that context, by the way, <laughs> you are wrong and she is right. 100%. <laughs> she is absolutely that's a, right. That's a very different example of what yes. we're talking about in the book. <laughs> yes. And it was actually never an argument because I knew that this was reality. But for you and your business partner, yes. your mindset was... Okay, so the conversation was whether to place a charger, the decorative yeah. plate on the table right. at the beginning of the meal. And I hated it. I I am... Why? I am someone for whom everything needs to make sense. <laughs> right. And every decision needs to be made with intention. Right. And if it doesn't serve the, the guest at right. the end of the day, then I don't think it's something we should do. If you're setting a charger... It's just another time we need to interrupt the conversation that's happening at the table to remove Correct. It. And I don't think that that's something we should do. He came from a much more classic fine dining background. And in those restaurants, you have the decorative plate. Right. Um, and so we, you know, I'm a pretty stubborn, hard-headed person right. when I know what right looks like. And, and he was the same thing. And, um, and so we went back and forth and back and forth. The third option was... One of many techniques that we identified over the course of our partnership to figure out how to solve those right. impasses. Um, and what we would do is both uh, basically abandon our individual uh, positions on it and then together figure out, okay, if neither one of us were able to get what we wanted, what would we pursue? Right. And the third option, again, a little bit of inside baseball, but we took the decorative plate and we designed it in a way such that there was a little hole in the middle to perfectly receive the first course. Right. So he got the charger. I didn't have to go and take it off the table right. unnecessarily. You got the lack of interruption. <clears throat> yeah. And it actually was a really cool moment where your first right. course just nestled perfectly into right. it. I think the third option, it does two things. One, it invites creativity and in moments of tension. Yes. Tension is a moment, especially in business, where people lean out. And one of the best things to encourage in a culture is for your team to embrace tension. Because here's what it means. It means that you and I both care so much yeah. about doing a great job that we're willing to argue about something as silly as a decorative plate. We yeah. both just really care. And when there's tension, it means we both really care. And by the way, everyone has worked in environments around other people that don't really care. And so you should celebrate tension. But if you lean into tension, 
what cooler thing than to find yourself in a brainstorming session in the midst of what would have once been an ugly moment? Well, that was the thought I had. <clears throat> that tension that you two stepped into led to collaboration. Yeah. And collaboration led to innovation. The third option, yeah. the innovation. For sure. But you can't innovate unless you embrace the struggle. A hundred percent. And again, back to the word, you just need to show intention. Yeah. Enough self-awareness to say, okay, this isn't going super well. Right. Now let's be intentional about getting through this and actually allowing it to be a positive thing. Mm. One of my dad's quotes in here is adversity is a terrible thing to waste. Yes. And that applies to so many things yeah. in life and work. But um, even if people don't have the ability to embrace tension as a beautiful thing and still want to call it adversity, you still shouldn't waste it. I agree. And on that point, I've had the privilege mm. to interview some great creative minds and every time I've come away from the conversation, they pointed to adversity yes. as times of the greatest innovation. For sure. They had to innovate because there was no other option. There yeah. wasn't a, a path this way or that way. They had to create a path. And that is that tension of adversity, I think, that you're talking about. If we learn to live in it, and as leaders, yeah, we have to. sit in it and yeah. love it when you're there. Great know things happen. That, yeah, know that some brilliant thing could be just around the corner as long as you don't run away from it. Mm. But it's true. We, I worked with an architect once, and it, like a world-class architect, a guy named Norman Foster. And he was saying that his best project that he ever did was he had a half an acre on a mountainside in Switzerland. And because it was so limiting what he could do, he created the work he was most proud of. And he's like, compare that to... You have to build a building in the middle of 500 acres of open land. There's almost so many options, so much limitless opportunity that it becomes overwhelming to a creative. If there is restriction, if there is tension, adversity, yes. lean into it because your best work is probably just around the it's corner. It's right. You know, it, 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 you know what it does is it, it, the brain is a beautiful thing and powerful, but that adversity that you just described, it allows us to channel. Yeah. Like now we go, okay, well, I don't have a million options. I got four. Yeah. Now what can I do with that? And, and by that the way, like the it gets your competitive, like, yes. you're like, all right, no, I got this. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, the pride, again, to the point of affirmation. Right. If you, if you like really come out of it, having done right. something amazing. Right. I mean, there's, there's nothing that can stop you. Okay. You've had wild success. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you really have. I'm, I'm not saying that as any kind of, that's just a fact. Okay. Look him up. I mean, you know, <laughs> you don't just do the number one. You don't make the number one restaurant in the world, you know, two times over. If yeah, I we, that we, right? we had a good run. Yeah, yeah it was nice. Sure. So, but you're still alive. I mean, your speech was great. You've written some great stuff for leaders in this book. I think this is a must read. Yeah. Um, what are you dreaming about? So I'll tell you what, I was one week away from signing three restaurants. So I sold my company before yes, COVID. That's right. Um, I was a week away from signing three restaurant leases in New York City when COVID started, and I didn't sign them right. for all, all the obvious reasons. Sure. And listen, I'm grateful. Everyone has, not everyone, a lot of people have their silver lining stories for COVID. That was one of them for me. Because here's the thing, when you do something and achieve some level of success in doing it, the moment you stop doing it, you start to question who you are, mm -hmm. right? You have like you, so much sure. of your identity is tied up in what you do. And so I think I was like almost frantically running to open more restaurants because I didn't know who I was right. without restaurants. COVID, we moved up to our ranch in the country. We relaxed for a little bit. And instead of running back to doing the thing that I'd always done, I was given the space to decide to do it again. Yeah. Um. I talk about, in the book, the need to name your own superpowers. Yes. Because until you know what they are, until you've been able to say them out loud, you can't leverage them completely. That's great. What I want to do is lean into my superpowers, but challenge myself in a different way. Um, the best way to articulate it is I've always believed in creating magical worlds and welcoming people into them for a few hours yeah. in the forms of my restaurants. How would you, by the way, interrupt you? Because this is fun for the audience to hear. Yes. If you're going to choose one word. Yes. Just for our conversation to describe your superpowers, what are they? I think I have probably three of them. One, empathy. Okay. Excellence. Creativity. 
Yeah. I, I think that's right. I like that challenge. Yeah. No, that's a good Because one. I think we all need to go through, and the, the point there is just to simplify. For sure. And you were racking your brain, but details are a part of it is excellent or it's not happening. I have an inability to walk into a room and not see every single detail. In fact, one of the things... Yeah, is it hard for you to go to a public event like church or a concert or another restaurant and not just like 73 things? I mean... Like, it's a beautiful mind? That's I've what learned, I picture I've you. learned to turn it off a oh, little bit. Can. Although I will walk into other restaurants or and just change things and fix things on my own as subtly as I possibly can so no one notices me. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're over there like distracting the waiter so that you yeah. can fix something. Yeah, exactly. I could see that. No, but I appreciate that because that's how you're wired. I I just don't feel settled right. until everything's in its right place and right place. And so like if there's really two superpowers and I had more words, it would be that. And the fact that I can put myself in other people's shoes quite easily. Mm -hmm. and I'm I've glad always... you chose that word empathy because I really do think at the core, that's what come, that's what fuels your customer service. For sure. Is empathy. Well, I can see what people want before they know they want it. That's, that's a great way of describing yeah. that superpower. And, and by the way, back to the detail I mean, there, there's overlap there, right? Because those are millions of details. And I I have a hard time feeling settled until I've given that to them. Well, there's a story you shared before we started recording, and it's actually from the series, you know, Seven Days Out on yes. Netflix, where you sat down at this very fancy, you know, fabric. <laughs> yeah. You'll know it. But you sat up against it in a T-shirt just yeah. to feel it. And it was prickly, my <laughs> word, or, or, or uncomfortable. Yeah. And you're like, that's not going to work. Yes. Because somebody could sit down, a woman with a thin blouse. It's the same thing as a T-shirt. Or a guy without a T-shirt on, wearing a dress shirt. Yeah. He sits back and he's like, ah, and you couldn't bear the thought of it. Well, you go to a fine dining restaurant, you're in that chair for three hours and it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And here's the thing. What's amazing to me is I saw that, I called it out to our architects, and this is one of the things that I can't stand m more than anything else. When you identify a problem and people's response is, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, it drives me crazy. By the way, there's always something you can do about it. That's right. You might just need to be a bit unreasonable in pursuit of doing that thing. And so what we did is... Pay it off. Yeah, I want the audience to hear what you did. No, we sent our entire team to Home <laughs> Depot. We bought like a dozen steamers and they spent five, six, seven hours steaming the fabric until it wore it in. How confident were you that that was going to work? Not 100% confident yeah. at all, but... We had to try. We had to do something. Yeah. The only way to go is forward. <laughs> right. Because I remember watching that going, that was an awesome bet. Well, I, you know what it was, actually, now that I remember it? What the what the designers said was, no, it just takes time to break in. So I was like, so what? So now the first <laughs> three months are so going to be So we awful? just give it everyone a discount <laughs> at the beginning? That's, <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, but to resolve the thought, if what I've done for a long time is build these restaurants, I, I would say that, in restaurants, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to create magical worlds in a world that needs more magic. Places that people can walk into, and when they do, through us leaning in and caring for them, the rest of the world falls away. The rest of their world gets put on pause. Yeah. Um, my next chapter, my second mountain, is going to be doing that not over the course of three hours, but over the course of three or four days. Mm. I want to see what I can do if people trust me with that much of their time, how I can create environments that are more welcoming, more authentically connective, more restorative. That's what I'm looking to do. I next. love that. Yeah. I love it. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. I think it'll do. be pretty fun. And I think the big takeaway that I want our, our larger audience to take away from this conversation is, and I want to give you the final word on this to challenge us, um, it's in the book title. But I think it has more implications than business. I think it is at the core of our humanness. Hmm. And in a increasingly diverse world, an increasingly separated world yeah. and, and, and areas of politics and religion and everything. You throw all the stuff that divides us. If there's one thing that unites us, it's that we just want to be treated with dignity. And I think that's at the heart of hospitality. Yeah. Challenges as humans, not just business leaders, to be more hospitable. Just to lean in a little bit. Like, 
Listen, unreasonable hospitality is the thing that helped me accomplish every single one of our professional goals. Yeah. And, and I really believe it turned the people I worked with from a collection of individuals into a trusting team. And so I wrote this book to basically just encourage people to the next time they find themselves pursuing a relationship, just try being a bit more unreasonable. Like in giving people a sense of belonging in giving their customers a memory that can last a lifetime. Because I do believe without question, it will transform the business. And also as importantly, it just feels really good. Mm. Yeah, it's the true reward of work. Yeah, Work matters because of the result that it creates. For sure. And that's what I teach every day. If you use what you do best, those superpowers, talent, yeah. to do work that you love, it yeah. lights you up, to produce a result that matters deeply to you, mm. you're on purpose. Yeah. That's the definition of purpose. Use what you do best to do work you love to produce results that matter to you. Dude, I love that. It's as simple as it gets. I'm just going to reprint the last page of this. That's and just fine. Throw it in there. Do the it. <laughs> yeah, just give me, give me a quote. But I, you know, but that's after years of coaching people live on the air, and I yeah. thought if I could, to your point, distill purpose in work yes. down to one sentence with no extra words. Yes. Use what you do best to do what you love to produce results that matter, mm. and and that is what it's about in our businesses. What are the results that your business exists to produce? And in our work, what are the results that your job exists to produce? Yes. Do that and watch the reward wash over you. Because by the way, then so many people talk about burnout. They yeah. talk about like yeah. how depleted they are at the end of the day. But can't if you be can, if you do that. That's the point. If you can figure out how to approach your work in a way that intrinsically restores you, then like, okay, we want life work balance, but you don't need it as much because life doesn't need to re-energize you for work. Work re-energizes you for work. 100%. And then you can use all the energy that you get from life and reinvest that back into life. That's it. I mean, think about what it's like for, for those of us. You and I experience this. I'm tired at the end of the day because I spend hours on in talking and thinking yes. at the same time. Yes. But then I go home and I'm a dad. Yeah. My teenagers don't care about any of the notoriety or anything. <laughs> and they just want me to help them with math. Yeah. Or my doodle just wants me to scratch his head. Yes. And I'm a husband and I'm a dad and I'm whatever. And then I'm in life. And then the next morning when I get in the car, I got the juice, man. For sure. Because I'm walking into an environment where I'm spending the majority of my day doing something I'm really good at. Yeah. Doing something I enjoy. Yes. And producing something that I care deeply about. Yes. And you cannot burn out. And you need all three. Yeah, you have to. You have talent, to have passion, and mission. Yeah. And, and, and and you won't burn out. Now you'll be tired, but you know you can be exhilarated and exhausted at the same there's time. There's a there's a real real wide space between being tired and being depleted. That's correct. That's yeah. a great statement. For sure. Yeah. You know, and then you were back at it again. So anyway, great stuff. I could talk to you forever. Dude, I love it, man. Love Thank you for having doing, me on. Man. It's going to be fun it. to see what your impact is uh, in the lives of leaders and in the actual, um, I think, lives of customers whose businesses lean on you. Well, man, I'm, I'm excited time. about this for my own industry, but I'm much more excited about it for all the other industries. Yes. I think there there's a real impact that can be had for industries across like disciplines. This will transform the trades. You want to be the winning HVAC company in huh. your zip code? Yeah. You want to be the winning electrician? You want to be the winning plumber? I'm not even joking. Yeah, yeah. This right here. Thank you. I'm telling you because I, w when the HVAC goes out in Nashville, Tennessee in July <laughs> and the guy shows up at my house, he's way more important than I am to for my sure. wife. And by the way, there's importance yeah, in but, that work. And but they they're going they're going to put up with you because of how important you are. Yeah. But if you show up and not just make my wife happy because she's not going to sweat tonight. Yes. But then you treat her and my kids and my dog with unbelievable, unreasonable hospitality. They're, my wife's going to tell every girlfriend that she knows about you. And by the way, the energy that that guy gets from your wife yeah. At the end of the day, to bring it back to what we were just talking about, yes. he is going to be less depleted at the end of his long, hard day. 100%. That's exactly right. Wow, oh, good stuff. We could go on and on and on, <laughs> but uh, we've already had a close, so thanks, bro. Thanks, bro. I enjoyed that. Dude. That was really fun. So fun, bro.